at that depth of field. Hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to OpenCV Weekly. I'm Dr. Satya Malik, CEO of OpenCV. Our guest this week is Alex Glow, who has the official title of Hardware Nerd at <laughs> Hackster.io, a leading community for technology projects and DIY hardware, uh, hardware hackers. And, uh, you know, it's great to have Alex uh, on the show today because she's going to talk about a very important topic. How do we move to greener and more sustainable electrical engineering? Uh, Alex, welcome to the show. But before we go to your introduction, let me first introduce uh, Phil Nelson, who is the director of content and creator at OpenCV. Uh, if anything goes wrong with this show, it is Phil's responsibility. <laughs> That is it's correct, Satya. Thank you. <laughs> yes, again, it is I, the co-host with the co-most, the second banana, who is second to none, your plus one and only Phil Nelson, mm -hmm. here to remind you of a few things we do every single week here on the show. The first of which is a giveaway to you in the audience. You'll be able to answer a trivia question later in the show on Zoom. You can get to Zoom by going to opencv.live if you're watching us elsewhere. At the time I ask the question, you will have the chance to answer and win the OpenCV course of your choosing. So stay tuned for that later. We're also taking Q&A from you in the audience, wherever you're watching, but especially here on Zoom, use that little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your question at any time during the show, and we will flow it into the conversation if we can, or we'll also save time at the end of the show for those questions we don't get to during our regular talking time here. Back to you, Satya. Well, Alex, welcome to the show. Uh, it's all your show. Take it from here, uh, first with an introduction, and then uh, you know we can go over uh, what you have to talk about. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Satya. Thank you, Phil. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, which is um, just sustainability in electronics in general, obviously, and more specifically, green EE. So uh, I figure that what we'll do is kind of run down the site uh, as it currently is. There's a lot of exciting updates that I'm hoping to push out later today. And uh, also, I've got some fun physical stuff to show off here in my own studio. Exciting. Which... Well, we get to see Archimedes today. Oh, Archimedes is right there. <laughs> I don't know if you can see him, but I've also got Fenrir, who is slightly more relevant to yes. this discussion. He's not on right now. He's, uh, as usual, kind of in progress, but usually I try and program him to have a little script of something to say. Alas, not today, but maybe next time. Um, don't be jealous out there, but I have met that robot in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this one is a lot more pettable. He's very soft, and uh, I hope that someday he gets to meet your virtual cat. This might be about as close as they get, you know, meeting in virtual space. I think, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so green EE. Actually, I wanted to start off um, with a little bit of introductory stuff. First off, uh, as you can see on this page, today is World Car Free Day, which seems very relevant. Oh. Um, I first created greenie.com for a talk that I gave on Earth Day at mm -hmm. Open Hardware Summit, and so the fact that today is. Uh, World Car Freedom. Wait, is it six months later? No, it's five months later, exactly. Uh, April 22nd is Earth Day. Today is September 22nd, World Car Free Day. It just feels very appropriate, and I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, also, uh, this month is September uh, Sustainability Month on Hackster. So uh, I am the video host and hardware nerd at hackster.io, <laughs> which is an online community of hardware developers, as Satya mentioned. And uh, so this month, Honestly, every month we're celebrating sustainability, but this month especially. So we've had uh, a couple of other months around like wearable electronics. Next month is art. Very excited for that, uh, especially with Halloween coming up. But this month we have a bunch of celebratory stuff planned and already in motion. You can share your projects on all these different uh, pages. You've got upcycling, weather uh, related projects, plants, all your you know, uh, plant watering systems and cute little things go there. Uh, sustainability, obviously. There's a whole hub for that full of delicious projects. It'll take a second to load here probably because my connection is wretched. And uh, environmental sensing and animals and things like that. Uh, we want you to register for Impact Summit, which is next month uh, on the 11th and 12th of October. Very exciting for us. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this, but we hope that it will become a tradition. Um, we've got lots of cool speakers, panels, workshops, uh, some giveaways, 
all kinds of cool stuff coming up for this and it's completely virtual and completely free so uh mm. and it's focused on um preserving our air and water through cool hardware so we got a ton of cool who's, speakers uh, for that. who's the keynote speaker on that one? Oh my gosh you know i can't currently remember <laughs> it's been quite a week <laughs> Uh, but I think we've got some pretty cool people. I know that Sarah Maston from Project 15 is going to be joining us uh, in Excellent. a, I think she's doing one of the keynotes, actually. There's two keynotes. And the other you one should. I can't pin down in my brain right now. But uh, yeah, uh, a lot of that stuff with... is going to be announced over the coming weeks, along with all these talks and panel <laughs> discussions and such like. I've personally invited a number of them. I'm going to be doing a couple of cafe sessions, which is part of my regular deal at Hackster. I'll talk about it in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also we'll be doing a hangout and nerd out special section session on uh, sustainability, which is a joint show that we're doing now with Make with my colleague Ginger Zeng and David Groom from Make. Very exciting. Um, I saw you. Didn't you just do the first one of those recently, right? We like did. Week? It was wearable tech and it was glorious. <laughs> we had <laughs> Deborah glorious. Ansel, Geek Mom no. Projects, Kitty Young, who does uh, art by physicist fashion uh -huh. tech and... Uh -huh. You know, I think I invited the other person in my brain who is drawing a blank right now. Did I mention one hour of sleep? But it was an it's, awesome session. It's the morning for it. It's the morning for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me a Welcome second. to the chaos stream, everybody. Indeed. <laughs> um, I am so abjectly apologetic to that person for forgetting who they are, but it's not you. It's me. Uh, then there's also a bunch of cool you know, news articles and stuff that we're sharing about that. We've got contests going on. IoT Into the Wild, which is a collaboration with Seed Studio around their new Sense Cap mm. uh, prototyping kits. We've got a Smarter Sustainable World Challenge with Edge Impulse and Nordic Semiconductor. And this other one with uh, NXP, the third Hover Games, which each year it's a, a UAV contest and uh, themed something about sustainability. There's one about fighting forest fires. This year's is wow. about land, sky, and food supply. And then there's Hexer Cafe. <laughs> so this is my weekly deal uh, at the risk of giving you a fire hose. Uh, every Tuesday, I talk to somebody. Fire hose us up. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm trying to slow it down. Uh, I got the sage advice before we started that uh, I should try and slow it down as much as possible and then slow it down a bit more, which is apparently a tip from wrestling but the, uh, the late great the, the, not the late the currently living somehow <laughs> and still great terry funk don't curse Thank him you, man terry. yeah uh, oh nothing can kill terry funk okay you, you're, <laughs> you're the one jinxing it it's not on me uh but so yeah hackster cafe weekly show interviews with super cool people in technology uh hardware specifically and we've had a couple of uh, especially sustainability themed ones recently, including mm -hmm. Crystal yesterday from Wild Grid Solar, who created the solar uh, window solar charger. And also Kyle Weens from iFixit, a personal kind of hero of mine. Um, yeah. Does a lot of right to repair stuff, uh, not just teaching people to repair stuff, although they do have apparently over 80,000 guides for repairing your stuff, I think. They also sell cool Jeez. tools. I know, right? And uh, they also advocate a lot for right to repair legislation. They're doing mm -hmm. lots of stuff in that realm as well. So that's extremely really important. important. That's right really now. nice, isn't yeah. it? That's really nice. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have been we have been using our stuff as if it is uh, you know you use and throw. There's no disposable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. there's no concept of repair in this country, which I was very surprised when I came here 22 years back. Um, and it's I mean it's gotten much worse actually over the years. Uh, you yeah. know, nothing is repairable now. Yes. Yeah. No thanks to John Deere. Aha. Yeah. We talked about that actually in the uh, in the cafe with Kyle. Um, he had just been to DEF CON and reported back about uh, someone running Doom on the John Deere tractor, uh, which is not yep. the first time that they've been in the news for trying to keep farmers re from repairing their own mm -hmm. tractors, which is, you know, A, it's bad for the world, and B, it's bad for the little guy, you know. Not that necessarily yeah. these people are little guys, but. The, in a, you know, compared, to, compared John to John Deere, Deere. like who's got, <laughs> yeah. you know, right. you should be able to own your things. And part of that is being able to take mm -hmm. them apart, repair them, even hack them, obviously. Like, of course, I yeah. believe that. And uh, they just make it, uh, you know, I, I've fixed my digital camera over here with a guide from iFixit years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
just it's a wonderful place to I, learn stuff. I used I really it to do my you. first ever MacBook uh, hardware hard drive swap. It was it was an iFixit guide? So thanks, iFixit. Nice. Uh, you'll if you watch the the interview, you'll also learn a fun little um, anecdote about uh, me swapping out RAM for them on stage once at a conference. <laughs> <laughs> Slick. But so. Now we get to the fun part because everything else was super boring <laughs> uh, so far where yeah. we go and talk about green ee -E. so this is uh i just love it um am i allowed to just gush about my own project here uh, i mean that's that's why you're here <laughs> yeah there's so this is, more has this come is the to ego light. stroking show I, <laughs> So more has come to light since I first created this. Uh, if you read the about page, you'll know that uh, part of the deal with me creating this was because I would love to build more electronics and there's stuff that I, you know, I love making stuff. And also it would be cool someday to maybe support myself partly that way. Uh, but also I don't want to do it if it's going to, you know, twist the world up even more and, and, and make me feel bad about myself. <laughs> and so I'm looking for... I went looking for just a set of guidelines on how to do electronics more better and uh, not finding a very centralized guide. I was like, well, I'll just grab all the resources that I can and stick them in one place and then share that with other people so that if other people are looking for the same stuff, then they can find it. Um, so that's how it was born. And since then, I've fortunately found a number of other cool things, including this venture well guide to tools for design and sustainability, which is designed for people, uh, I think partly for students. Let me get a better aspect ratio here. Um, but also, and, and teachers, but in general for engineers and designers. And they go through everything from like whole system mapping, measuring sustainability, greener materials, light weighting, which I believe is like how to use less when you're manufacturing things. But look how exhaustive this is, it's incredible. And I haven't had the chance to go through this yet, but I really want to. And circular economy, energy effectiveness, uh, changing lifestyles, biomimicry, uh, which is one of my favorite subjects. Biomimicry and biocollaboration. Um, oh, man, we can get into that a little bit. It's definitely included on Green EE. -E. But yeah, so I've since found resources like that that sort of match what I was trying to do with this in the first place. But I still think that there's a, a good reason to have another repository that links to that as well as to a bunch of other options. And the way that I've set this up is that, uh, first off, there's some questions. So, you know, what impact can we as individuals have? And apparently this is still linking back to the GitHub wiki where it uh, originated. But, mm. um, you know, the climate situation, let's pull this on up on the actual one because it's linked in the header here. Mm -hmm. um, not that one. <laughs> Power. Power is a very uh, ambiguous header here, I guess. But yeah, mm -hmm. so it sort of shifts this idea from it being our fault. It can get it'd be very easy to sort of get into this sort of shame spiral. And I talked actually about this with Crystal uh, yesterday as well. Um, you know, how a lot of us can get kind of paralyzed by this idea that there's this huge thing to fix and that we're part of the problem and that, you know, there's nothing that we individually do. But if you shift it away from sort of a blame and shame and fault finding kind of thing, uh, which honestly, any one of us compared to like, uh, one of my favorite things to point out here is that BP is the one who created the idea of the carbon footprint, basically to shift their responsibility for carbon emissions onto mm -hmm. the every person. Um, you know, Much it's, like the history of jaywalking laws here in, in the U.S., so those were created by car companies so they could shift the name from their products. Absolutely. Like, I love the history of that term. Do you know that jaywalking, the, the way that... The place that comes from is that a J was like a term for a country person, like a bumpkin who didn't know what it was like in the city. And so they painted oh. them as this like, yeah, as this like basically, you know, oh, it's jaywalking. They don't know how the city works. Yeah. Uh, they're just like walking wherever when like Those, these rumble bumble country rubes yeah, come into the city. And, it was a really yeah. good trick they pulled. So um, yep. I love that. Thanks example. a lot, yeah. Dodge Brothers mm. or mm -hmm. whatever. 
right. and so in much a similar vein you know bp has done this to sort of foist the responsibility onto us and make us feel mm -hmm. like oh you know it's because i used it didn't use my tote bag when i went to the, to the grocery store you know no it's because right. of them but but even though it's largely their fault we still have power to change it and part of that is through our individual actions and part of that is through you know we have the the um power to talk to our representatives to really get on their backs and be like hey you know uh our power is, is this sort of collective power where we can uh get our legislators to take them uh get them to take responsibility mm -hmm. put the responsibility back on the companies mm -hmm. enact legislation regulations uh you know in germany there's requirements that you have to sort of take care of the product life cycle and offer recycling for uh, hardware project products that are returned to your company which i think is amazing i've learned that talking to the guys from uh, mnt reform an open source laptop mm -hmm. that is very modular and repairable super cool yeah Lucas Hartman, that was another of the cafes that we did. So, um, you know, we start out with a few of these questions and then another question about like, why are you building a new thing? Uh, you know, is there, if it's in order to solve a need, is there an existing product that, project that does what you want? Could you contribute to that? Would it be as, you know, just as fulfilling for you? And would you be able to take it further that way by collaborating? Uh, is there a low tech solution? I love rumble strips, and I also love this example of um, somewhere down here of uh, putting black paint on one blade of a wind turbine helps protect birds. They can see the wind turbines and they avoid them. Uh, and it's wow. such a low tech solution. You know, you could put hmm. sensors on it, and you could require it to be powered, and you could have it like do some kind of alarm thing or like uh, you know stop the turbine or something, but you can also just paint one uh, wing of it black. Rumble strips. What's the deal with uh, painting one black? Is it because they see the gradient? What's the? I think it's the so reason? they can see it better. Yeah. I'm not but sure why one, you wouldn't do all what? three of them. I don't know. I should look into that because right. I'm also. But curious. it seems like you wouldn't necessarily have to because it's not as though they move super fast. I think it's just more of a, if they can see one aspect of it, be like, oh, there's a thing there. Cool. I'll yeah, maybe. It's it's a, I'm guessing that it is because one of them is, at least one of them is white and the other is black. So you mm. get both colors uh, mm. and you see this difference, right? Right. So it looks like something moving is moving. Yeah. 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 It's like maybe if you just have uh, white, then it blends with the background and black is the opposite, right? So if you have black and white, both of them, maybe one of them will show show up as if it's moving, right? Um, yeah. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Absolutely. I, I bet you're completely right on that. And um, rumble strips are kind of the same. I think they're a beautiful, elegant solution to the idea of like, you know, people falling asleep at the wheel or like lose it, getting distracted by stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you could put some sensors in the car. There are things that, you know, you can attach to your face where it'll like detect if you're uh, falling asleep and like, give you an alarm or something you could have like a little thing that shocks you you could have but rather than having something special installed in everyone's car or on everyone's face or like all this extra technology you just literally put a physical uh attribute into the road uh just just something that doesn't even take any extra material and uh and fixes the problem Largely, you know, you still need other, other guardrails and stuff. But um, so that's, you know, another of the questions or is there something you can repurpose? I love this line from iFixit. The greenest phone is the one that's already in your pocket. Um, they really hammer that home. And I love that line. Um, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. What, what does that mean? Uh, well, basically, you know, you could build a greener phone. You could buy a greener phone. Yeah. Like if you go out tomorrow and buy a greener phone because you're like, oh, man, this phone I have is crap. It takes so much materials and stuff. Well, now you've just bought another thing and used more materials. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's the same criticism people had about Obama's, uh, what was it called? Uh, something for clunkers. Uh, the cash car, for clunkers. Uh, cash for clunkers. Cash, cash for clunkers program mm -hmm. that, okay, now you are replacing that car with a newer car. Maybe it is more efficient, but actually that car you just got rid of is going to create, I mean, that's material, right? You actually... Yeah got rid of mm -hmm. something um, to and bought a new uh, new thing yeah, yeah. And, uh, so yeah mm -hmm. there's still this con criticism levied against uh, electric vehicles that you know they do require these batteries that are very expensive materially and uh, uh, to produce and carbon wise to produce uh, 
with requiring mining lithium, for example. And so we're looking at building better batteries and things like that. And that's a really interesting space. Um, yeah, and it's some... not like those those lithium mining companies, surprisingly not the most ethical uh, organizations you'd, not. you'd really think uh, of all after all these years, those those good, kindly mining organizations that we have a history of in the United States. Um, yeah, no, it's that way everywhere, apparently. Yeah. Just ask someone from, say, Appalachia. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, cobalt as well. So um, one of the cool things about that uh, MNT Reform laptop I mentioned before is that they use these 18650 size uh, battery cells, but they're lithium iron phosphate instead of cobalt, which, you know, it's still lithium, but at least it's taking the cobalt out of the mix, which is also a conflict mineral. So... Mm. Um, have, you, yeah. have you ever wondered that we have these very heavy subsidies for electric cars, right? Electric cars mm -hmm. don't need any subsidies. They they cannot produce as fast as the demand is there right mm. now in the United mm -hmm. States, right? If you want to buy an electric car, I want to buy an electric car and I have to wait for six months wait to buy yeah. one. Oh, I didn't right? know that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you can't from Tesla. If you want to buy a Tesla, I think the delivery is uh, at least three, four months away, right? Is that related to the uh, chip shortage or? It's, related to the demand i mean in my neighborhood every i mean i think i think tesla is the most used car uh, mm. at least second car right uh, i was actually shocked how many people uh, in southern california use tesla mm. but yeah. uh, another piece uh, you know here is that they don't have any subsidies for bicycles why not right mm -hmm. the people who are riding bicycle they are actually helping and mm -hmm. you can go one yeah. step further and say that electric bikes should also have because oh, absolutely. With, bicycles, with bicycles, there is a limitation, right? You can get tired and you will not go up, uh, very far places. But with an electric bike, you can go, you know, you can do your groceries. You can do a lot of things with an electric bike. Um, and there are no subsidies for electric bikes, mm -hmm. right? So uh, a very simple yeah. thing like that uh, could, could encourage people to buy. Yes. And well, it's more yeah, than a subsidy. More than the actual subsidy, it's the fact that people start talking about electric bikes. It will bring, uh, you know, when you're trying to think, okay, maybe I should get an electric bike. At least people who have uh, disposable income, they may have an electric bike for doing chores. Um, you know, uh, not not uh, like groceries, for example, is a classic uh, case. So yeah, that, that yeah. consciousness raising is is really important because I mean yeah. you know a lot of people may not even know how good electric bikes have gotten mm. uh, in the years and and you know a big part of that too is just culturally in the U.S. like here here in San Francisco you know the the example city everybody uses for like the kind of wet hippy dippy liberal <laughs> you know elites every time like th there's like two there's like two streets in this city that have protected bike lanes. Like every single time there's some kind of proposal for it, it's like, no, it costs too much. <laughs> and they're like, I guess people, you know, constantly being run over by cars is cheap. Yeah. And also, you know, the Valencia Street bike lane is mm. essentially a parking lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the way people treat it. Like yep. uh, it's always full of cars. Uh, it does bring us back to this, uh, you know, World Car Free Day. Hooray. And, you know, yeah. I use Germany the, has I have... subsidies for bikes. Um... Yeah. Mm. According to uh, Jot Jotchen Jochen in the uh, chat here, thank you, thanks for that. Yeah, and uh, I personally use e-bikes. Um, I mm. have a regular bike, but I use e-bikes. Uh, I use the lift ones, the rentable ones, um, yep. to go to, for example, the dentist when I don't want to show up really sweaty and gross <laughs> for my <laughs> dentist appointment, right. and I don't want to, you know, and I want to take a bike. It's like okay, I'll take an e-bike, and it won't mm -hmm. like tax me physically and i'll get to like show up and the dentist won't have to deal with sweaty alex will be great <laughs> so, it's, it's also the lifestyle um like i grew up in india mm -hmm. and uh i my, my family did not have a car right my family did not even have a, a, a motorbike which is very common at least at that time it used to be very common um everybody in the family they would have a motorbike but the system is set in such a way that even if you did not have that, you can have, you know, there is public transportation. Then most of the things I did was on my bicycle. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the system is set up in such a way that you can live without, uh, an, uh, without an automobile. Now I think things are slightly different. But growing up, 
I, I could do everything. everything. I never felt that I needed a car or, you know, we were missing out on something because nobody around had uh, those things as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, but the carbon footprint that we talk about here, people talk about, oh, you know, how you take your grocery bags, etc. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me laugh because it's a very different, you know, uh, middle class people in India would use 100 times less carbon than uh, mm. people in the United States. Uh, and they don't even have to try because the system is set up in such a way that, um, you know, you're not missing out on anything. anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should. Uh, this reminds me. I, I met this amazing person uh, as in Shenzhen a few years ago, and there's this guy Push Bajaj who had uh, an electric unicycle, and he apparently worked at this place, lived and worked at this place. The, it was sort of a, a a manufacturing, sort of independent manufacturing, uh, almost like a a compound for these electric unicycles, and he would take that thing, you know, 20 kilometers across the city to come meet us somewhere. Uh, and he had no problems with it. And I just thought it was, you know, you, you just don't really see that as much. Although those are pretty, uh, they're pretty popular here. And I love seeing people go around on them because they make me think of cyborgs. They totally look like uh, cyborg creatures. But I'm noticing that we're at like 930. So I should probably try and just like zip through this really quick. Um, Sorry, keep going. Got, oh, no, no, so it's fascinating. Jokes. I love it. <laughs> you know, I've seen all yeah. this stuff a thousand times and people can totally go back and look at it later. Uh, I'm loving this conversation. But just to mm -hmm. really quick uh, go down the line, you got, we've got sections for building and shipping hardware, uh, the design, the physical design, uh, how you power it. And I get into that a little bit with Crystal as well. Very much, you know, powering individual devices and reforming that versus like trying to reform the entire grid. Um, mm. And I think that what she's doing is amazing there. Um, repairability, extending your project's lifespan, what I call after party, which is, you know, this thing of um, creating new add-ons for retro tech so that you can sort of bring it back to life and keep things alive. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can do the same thing with software, like the rebel uh, movement for uh, replacing the OS on Pebble smartwatches Pebble. when they were retired. Was, and what's really cool is <laughs> no, apparently I, I talked to David Groom, who's uh, one of the originators of that project, and apparently Pebble really worked with them on that process, like keeping from shutting down the servers for long enough that they could really uh, back it up and get a, a replacement system working, which I love. Um, that's cool. That's then there's cool. like open design and manufacturing options, uh, software, KiCad, love it. Um, mm. uh, open tools for PNP and like vacuum. Pixel yeah, point. I saw I saw uh, Joey Castillo's sensor watch on Love there. It. I don't know if folks, yeah, I don't know if folks in the show can can we pull that up on the screen here. I, I don't know if people are uh, aware of that project. It's one of my faves. The probably the most ubiquitous digital watch in history. In the Casio F ninety one. Yeah, I've, I've got one over just far enough away I can't reach it, but yeah. <laughs> watch. Um, so Please. yes, this is a whole a whole modern like guts re-implementation uh, that fits inside the the case and hard uh, existing hardware like the sensor watch it's so good awesome? yeah and you can add your own little flex 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 cable uh connected mm -hmm. sensor on this uh attachment that he has he has a connector in there that you can add a, a, any kind of tiny little sensor that you can fit on a little flex cable you can put it in there i love it um which is yeah, why partly why it's called the sensor watch um, Joey, I believe doesn't Joey was also the one working on the the ebook reader, right? Yes, uh, which is another project I've followed for a while and super interested in. From oddly yeah. specific objects, which is a wonderful yeah. co uh, company name. Great, great title. Yeah. Uh, there, oh, uh, it just struck me. Of, uh... his, his logo is a bear, and oddly specific objects is also, which is a which is bear in Spanish. I bet that. Oh, ah. that just hit me. That's so great. We'll we'll clip this for uh, for promotional uses later and tag Joey in it. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the shock there, of the shock of revelation was thankfully captured on camera. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, is there a list of uh, a list of uh, computer vision related hardware that we know for sure uh, that has been produced with uh, you know lesser environmental Damage, so cool. are there are there certifications or things like that that people get for such things there are definitely certifications so that's a little bit further down here uh just really quickly on the way there uh project inspiration is a huge part of this one of my favorite parts and i talked about uh collaborating with other um bio collaboration 
and that there's this huge mm. section on like working with clams and fungus and stuff like that and and microbes which i love okay so uh hardware platforms certifications and guidelines you can get rojas certification um there's open source hardware certification just for like open source hardware obviously tco certification which is more of an environmental and social responsibility one but it's all the way through the supply chain and throughout the product life cycle which is super cool there's mm. you can you know you can be a registered b corporation which is just like you're sort of saying that in your business structure you're going to say that you care about you know, one of your priorities is to support uh better practices and to employ them in your corporation and then I fix it also has some really cool uh, electronics repairability scores for laptops and phones and such like. That's that's really good. And we hit yeah. the bottom of the page. That's great. That's really interesting. I could show you some uh, physical things really quick, or we could open it up for uh, for discussion. Oh, submit let's, your links. There's a link at the top. Yeah. Submit cool let's, links here. Show us show us some more stuff. We got we got time. Oh yeah, cool. Okay, so here's Fenrir. Fenrir <laughs> is. Uh, one of my yeah, can we bots. can we get a, a tight the tight shot on the guest cam operator? <laughs> Let me see if I can sure put him on. He's been falling off lately because I tend to yeah. wear him with a, a bag that sort of holds it in place. Right. So this this is one of your uh, cobots. Your your yeah. Tell tell the tell the crowd a little bit about this. Uh, yeah. So um, I love the first one is up there, Archimedes the owl. Um, but Archimedes is actually the name of Merlin's uh, familiar ah. owl uh, from well, you know the Sword in the Stone wrong. earlier, uh, the Once and Future King, which mm. uh, is something that my dad read to me when I was a kiddo, and later on at the hackerspace in Ann Arbor, All Hands Active, someone gave me the name Merlin, uh, and so <laughs> after I built this thing. Uh, I realized that I had built a thing that I'd been dreaming of for years and I built it mm. by accident, which was like a familiar robot basically. And then I realized that my nickname was Merlin and I had built an owl just like by happenstance. <laughs> uh, and so of course I had to come Archimedes, uh, of course in the once the future King, uh, TH white says that, like, or Merlin, you know, the, the character says that like, uh, you may not call him Archie. Uh, Arthur is like, I shall call him Archie. And uh, Merlin's like, you shall not. <laughs> he would hate it. So, but I do call him Archie. So, um, I mean, you'd have to. Score obviously. one for me, I guess. But this yeah, is most, been... most of my knowledge of that comes from the uh, Mystery Science Theater episode, Merlin's Shop of Mystical Wonders. So <laughs> not, I'll uh, have to check that out. That sounds wonderful. The, yeah. It's very bad. It's a yes! very bad movie. Even better. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess that's how they got on the show, huh? Uh, exactly. But yeah, so this guy sort of employs some of those practices. I prototyped him in cardboard. You can actually still see some of the goldfish crackers box uh, on the back of his head here and kind of sandwiched <laughs> in other places. Yeah. Um, and I've tried to sort of use good materials for him throughout. Also, when I repair Archimedes, I've tended to use, like, I was experimenting with recycling plastic on my own for a while. Um, mm. HDPE specifically from, like, gallon milk jugs and things like that. Uh, or, you know, court ones will do it as well. But um, I was trying to yeah, there, squirt it through. There were those hot glue guns. things that like uh, chopped up, you know, plastic to re to make, you know, uh, 3D printer spaghetti. That, yes. That kind of, it seems like that kind of didn't really go anywhere. Oh, it definitely has. So this is actually really? U-Hips. It's uh, from Closed Loop Plastics. And this is another one of the projects that I wanted to show you. Um, it is on Hackster now as of last week. Mm. The Jewel Candle. Uh, which is based on a Jewel Thief PCB that I made. Uh, the Jewel Thief is a uh, circuit not invented by me, but oddly enough, invented in the same city where I was, um, hmm. which is uh, a fun coincidence, but it basically allows you to run stuff off of nearly dead batteries, double A's, triple A's, right. CR2032s. And so I made a PCB of that, uh, inspired by Big Clive and Zed Kaparnik. Could, could you repeat that? It allows you to run this thing from dead batteries? Yeah, basically. So yeah, don't, don't you this is a, don't you, don't you wind like a like a toroid or something with those? Yes, a ferrite toroid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fun word to say, toroid. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, much more fun than donut. <laughs> well, donut is fun too, but uh, yeah, that basically yeah. stores uh, electrical. It, it builds up electrical energy as magnetic field um, coming from in like in sort of trickles from the battery. And then eventually that field breaks down and dumps it all back into the circuit as electrical energy, which then gets pumped through the LED 
uh, along with a small trickle of voltage that you're getting from the battery and together they're able to like light it up for a flash and uh, it looks like it's on constantly to our eyes because but it's actually like PWMing and uh, very cool so basically this just breaks that out into a candle uh, holder for an LED tea light so that you don't have to go through a million CR2032s you can run it off of dead batteries mm -hmm. instead and use those up uh, but Part of the reason that I brought this up is because it's uh, printed out of this recycled U-Hips material that comes from basically solo cups and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, they have a pink mm. version as well. It's This is the Nebula Black from uh, Closed Loop Plastics. And yeah. it's kind of a dark plum, which I love, like a matte dark plum. Uh, yeah, it has, yeah. A cool, it has a cool color when the light catches it there, which is uh, kind yeah, of right? rare, for, rare for 3D printer filament. It's kind of sci-fi, I think. Um, plus there's the shape and then there's this other uh, PCB that I made that's the sort of Hackster 2022 PCB which embodies another wow. one of my ideals about building electronics which is that like for both of these PCBs even if they didn't work they both work as kind of cool designs so I make these into right. earrings I wear these as earrings all the time um, also it's like a part of the functional design that it has this slot in here but it also makes it easy to do that with uh, same with this guy. It's sort of an aesthetic thing as well as a practical thing. You can use it as, for example, a bookmark, uh, sort of um, possibly a chip clip. You could sandwich a little razor blade in there to open packages with. Hmm. Um, complete uh, right. disclaimer <laughs> on any damages through that. <laughs> but uh, you could use it as a little book light, and you could also wear it as an earring or like a, a key fob or something like that. That's cool. So, uh, and I found out recently that Alpenglow, Carrie Sundra of Alpenglow, another person I uh, interviewed recently, has had a similar idea. She created this swatch mm. minder, which is like a, a yarn tool, which is uh, made from the circuit board waste from a different circuit board that she created as well. So I love stuff like this where you're using cool. the offcuts. Uh, yeah. And if like, you know, the even if it doesn't work as a circuit, you can still use the physical object uh, and keep it out of the landfill, basically. Very cool. I think so. <laughs> so yeah, there's Pretty a. Nice. I got projects up for all of these things. You can go check out my extremely. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain how the jewel thief works, and other people have done it better than me. So you can get a rundown on that. In this. Yeah, I I, I tried. Um, I actually had a project a couple of years ago where I was working with. Uh, super capacitors that instead of batteries, just uh, with the idea yeah. that I could make one, I could get a, a capacitor just big enough that it would power a, a solar, you know, a solar powered light could store enough energy that it would be yes. able to use it for like most of the evening instead of needing a battery because the shelf life on those capacitors is like forever compared to the one year or so you'll get out of a battery at most before it explodes or something, especially if it's outside. Um, it was really fun. I, it was the first time I, I like, I, you know, hand wound a, a little toroid. I or, love or that. Or like toroid. Yeah. Yeah. Adafruit um, sells some really tiny little uh, solar cells. I do see some people using those with, with super capacitors for, uh, yes. for stuff. Yeah. The little, I have a little, I had a couple, like two little tiny ones, like you'd find on the old Casio uh, uh, solar powered calculators. Love it. Yeah. Um, um, those are really fun. Oh, I, I feel, totally it feels totally like magic nice. when you do that. I, I feel like it feels like magic doing that sort of stuff. Absolutely. It does. It does feel kind of Merlin-y where you're yes. you're sort of making the making the electricity bend to your whims. <laughs> you're speaking my language. And uh, Mohit Bohite has a really cool uh, little project. This tiny little satellite uh, that's a Pummer mm. circuit from Beam Robotics, but with this beautiful bent brass uh, rod format with some uh, solar cells that are very similar to those wow. little calculator ones and a little super capacitor and look at wow. it and the pummer it, it idea looks like a, it's like a, it looks like a space station or a satellite yeah right? that's so cool and the pummer like does a little periodic flash just based on how much uh power wow. it's getting in love it that's uh yeah, most of what like i had to show you way too much for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, don't know if I, I don't think i could do it it's it's wow. so beautiful. All his work is gorgeous. Um, this yeah. is the final tab I had pulled up. Just uh, the Jiva Materials is doing a, a recyclable PCB substrate, and there's some more stuff in Green EE about like chitin-based 
uh, PCB substrates that have been proposed from, uh, you know, cast off shrimp shells from food production. Um, huh. Just all kinds of cool stuff about, you know, wow. closing that loop, making it a, a sort of self-feeding ecosystem where we don't have to produce as much waste or uh, create so as have, many I have new this, materials. Uh... I have this uh, low tech um, story about uh, you know the the life cycle of a t-shirt in uh, in <laughs> India. Uh, this was this was uh, me growing up, but even now in middle class uh, India, so this is what the life cycle of a t-shirt goes through. You know, you buy a new t-shirt, you wear it for a couple of years or maybe even more, as what is called the outside t-shirt, right? You wear it when you're going out, um, and then yeah. that t-shirt becomes your uh, night you know you wear it in, in the house or uh while sleeping etc right so that's the second use of it it goes for two more years right mm -hmm. once uh, you have you know completely worn it down uh you basically use it as a, a tabletop uh a rag right if you want mm -hmm. to uh clean tabletops and things like that yeah. and then you know that lasts for about three months or maybe six months i don't know and then it goes to mopping you know it's used for oh, mopping the floor yeah. right and then it's you know there is nothing left <laughs> pretty much yeah so that's the life cycle of a t-shirt uh mm -hmm. and i i think even even now in middle class india um most of the t-shirts probably go through that life cycle so it's very different you know uh the lifestyle we have here right my old t-shirts i just donate it and maybe one person gets to wear it and then it goes Right, but here mm -hmm. you can see that it goes through this this pretty there's intense a, life cycle, a, and every bit of it is here. used. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and India also recycles. I mean, it's sad, but uh, India recycles a lot. Uh, it's surprising, and the reason it can recycle is that uh, there are people, uh, there are very poor people there for whom just going through that recycling and uh, you know selling the recycled bottles and things like that it is financially okay for them, right? Mm -hmm. It is kind of sad, but uh, because of that, there is a lot of recycling uh, that happens uh, in India um, because of that reason also. So yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's uh, strange, you know, how these things, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of things we, uh, in, in the United States, the kinds of things that we are proud of, that makes only a fraction of what people do in the rest of the world, um, as regular practice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Just we have some perspective. Absolutely, and there's people who That's do true. make their living that way in uh, cities like San Francisco, but I think it's a lot harder to, you know, get a, like a living wage that way. Um, yeah. There are companies. No, like it's a, not good living. I mean, I'm no, not yeah. suggesting that people are getting good. These are really poor people mm -hmm. uh, yeah. below the poverty line. It's not a good living at all. Uh, but that's what it is. Uh, that's part of the reason India recycles. Uh, so much mm. of what it consumes, right? It's, yeah. it's you know, the, by, by necessity, it's I mean, very sad. I mean, it's yeah. not good at all. But uh, as a as a consequence of that, India does recycle a lot. Makes sense. Yeah, and there Makes are sense. some, fortunately, there's some uh, groups that are currently moving to do similar things here. There's a couple of different services I pulled up here really quick that uh, are places that you can order these bags from and fill them with your uh, cast off textiles and they will sort them and, you know, figure out whether they can be reused or uh, the fabric can mm. be turned into, for example, insulation for houses or uh, things like oh. that. They'll figure out where it can go and get reused or best used in the waste stream or diverted to something less harmful. And uh, you can get subscriptions for this and stuff. This is resold recycle, wow. retold recycling, and four days. Hmm. Who also make uh, clothing out of recycled textiles, which I, I'm excited to see that there's more going on in this space now. But there's definitely room yeah. for more. Yeah, apparently wow. uh, something similar is there for uh, road material also. That plastic oh, and yes. other things which cannot they are using for roads. Yes, I love that. So yeah, I wonder, is it cat time yet? <laughs> I don't know how this works. Yeah, operator, can we uh, can we please get the cat cam? I think it's one of the 99s. Yeah, there's <laughs> our buddy. So uh, folks out there watching, if you've, if you've been with us for a, a couple of weeks, you may recognize our uh, feline companion here in the studio who tragically uh, does not have a name. You can help 
solve that horrible problem by sending your suggestions to newsletter at opencv.org uh, or by posting here in the chat, of course. We will read out the best suggestions for cat names on next week's episode. No promises on when it gets named. I think with this sort of thing, you just you, you know it when you hear it, and we just haven't quite heard it yet. So <laughs> please send those suggestions to newsletter at opencv.org, and we'll read the best ones next week. Um, I think let's let's do our let's do our giveaway here since we're we're hitting up about yeah, about nine fifty. So <clears throat> excuse me. If you need a reminder, this is your first time joining us. Either way. There's something we do every week here, which is a giveaway to you in the audience. You're going to have the opportunity to answer a trivia question that I've made up based on what we talked about today here in the Zoom chat. If you're not in Zoom, you can hop into Zoom by going to opencv.live. If you have won within the last two months, please don't answer and give somebody else a chance to win. Get ready to answer in the Zoom chat. Everyone within the sound of my voice. Um, earlier, we talked about how this is, uh, uh, you know, an important time for uh, sustainability, and it, it's it's car free day. Earlier, we talked about another very important and, and one of the oldest environmental holidays here in the United States, Earth Day. On what day does Earth Day occur, and when was the first Earth Day held officially in the United States? Answer in the Zoom chat, and you will win the OpenCV course of your choosing. Oh, I don't know the second part of that. I only really know the first <laughs> one. Damn, GM Gian, Paulo. John Paulo. Wow. Nice. Like out of the out of the box there. Uh congrats, <laughs> congrats, John Paulo. Uh please send one e the answer was uh April twenty second, nineteen hundred seventy. Congratulations, John Paulo. Please send one email to Phil at opencv.org with the course you would like and we'll make sure that you get assigned access to that in the OpenCV courses uh, dashboard. Um, yeah, so we've got we've got a few questions here today. Uh, first off, I want to say thanks to everybody for submitting your uh, OpenCV spatial AI, uh, OpenCV AI competition, spatial AI track proposals on Monday, which was the deadline. Uh, we got quite a few of those and we're currently going through them and we'll be contacting the 25 chosen teams very soon so we can get them their Oak D pros so they can start Ooh. working on improving that depth estimation uh, functionality. So thanks. Thanks a lot for that. You've still got until uh, sometime in October to submit your proposals for the OpenCV core side of that OpenCV AI competition 2022, which you can follow on all your social media channels with the hashtag Oak 22, O-A-K-2-2. So please follow along there. And if you're part of the contest, post your progress updates using the tags so people can see it. Um, we've had a lot of success in the past. Last week we had uh, Bart who is revolutionizing sports with VR, which is not something I thought was even possible, <laughs> but uh, extremely compelling stuff. And it started with an open CV competition. So that could be you. Uh, please please uh, don't underestimate yourself. Get those things submitted by sending one email to competition at opencv.org with info about your team and what you'll be doing. Um, so Tia, is there any more is there any more news we want to do before we do questions? Uh, not really. I mean, that was I think, the uh, is there is there a, there's a giveaway with Learn OpenCV still ongoing, isn't there? So with Learn OpenCV, basically we are giving away. Uh, today is the last day, I think. Or uh, yeah, today is the last day. Uh, basically, NVIDIA GTC is going on, and if you register through our uh, website, learnopencv.com, there is a giveaway, you know, GTC, this uh, 3080 Ti, uh, yeah. we are giving away to one lucky winner. So you have to go register and also actually attend one of mm -hmm. the sessions. So please uh, keep a screenshot of the registration as well as uh, the session you attend. And uh, that's, uh, you know, I think you ha you probably have just a few hours to register now because it's going to end soon. Yeah, hurry up and register for that so you can get that card just before it becomes obsolete when the 4090s drop. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, it's thanks still a, a very powerful, <laughs> it's a very powerful thing. And 
The other thing is that we also have five DLI credits, Deep Learning Institute credits, and each of these credits are worth uh, $90 or so. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, six prizes in all. So please uh, join and uh, register. Yeah. yeah and what it's, if, what if I've been you? following GTC. I've, uh, uh, I have attended many sessions. This is mind blowing stuff uh, for computer vision folks. This is, they have, they actually are doing so many different, uh, they're pushing on so many different fronts. It's amazing. You know, they have this Omniverse, uh, they have NVIDIA Tau, they have uh, something for robotics, the Isaacson. So there's yeah. a lot to learn. Uh, yeah. So even if you go and uh, see the recordings, it's it's really good. So uh, check that out. Definitely. Um, there's also this uh, next week is the big Intel innovation event. Um, oh, yeah. There's also the, as, as part of that, if you're in the Bay Area in, in San Jose, California, in fact, there is the developer meetup, which is being uh, kind of try try hosted by Intel, Hackster, and OpenCV. That's us. Uh, September twenty mm seventh, -hmm. five to seven p.m. Uh, you can this register Tuesday. for that by going to this this coming Tuesday. That's right. You can register for that by going to hackster.io/events. You'll see it at the uh, on the page there. Um, I'll probably be there. There may be OpenCV stickers. I'm not going to promise anything. Um, but if you see me there, please tell me uh, your, your best name for the cat. <laughs> There's also um, uh, upcoming, the as Alex already talked about, the Impact Summit by Hackster. That's October 11th and yeah. 12th. So uh, you can register for that, which is a virtual event, by going to hackster.io slash events as well. Um, let's get to a couple questions before we run out of time here. So. We've gotten this one a couple times already. Uh, I think Satya probably has a lot of thoughts on this, and I'm sure Alex does as well. One of the big things in terms of sheer carbon footprint in computer vision is artificial intelligence and deep learning. The, it takes a massive amount of power to just train a model using those huge, you know, GeForce and, and Tesla and, and whatnot GPUs. Yeah. Um, yeah, Satya, what are what are your thoughts on on the, the state of things today? Like, what what do you think the next improvements come from for both computer vision and artificial intelligence in terms of using less power and being more sustainable? Right. So uh, the very first thing I want to mention is about scale. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, these are power hungry, and you know each version of uh, this new hardware, it gets more power efficient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 30, 40 power efficiency from one uh, version to another is uh, not uh, not unheard of, right? It happens. And because there is such a push for doing everything on the edge, uh, these, these there's incentive for these companies to make it very uh, power efficient. But we also have to keep things in perspective. Uh, for example, this, uh, I think there was a tweet by Jan Luckin who, mm. uh, who did this calculation. I think it was for GPT, one of the large language models. I cannot remember which exactly it was. He did the calculation, uh, how much uh, energy was, maybe Jan Lekin did not do the calculation, maybe he was just retweeting, but uh, the energy that was spent in, um, in creating that model, right? All versions of that model was the same as one trip uh, intercontinental trip uh, from Europe to US, uh, mm. that's that's it, on, on a, a Boeing 737 or something like that, right? Mm. There are 1,700 such flights every day, right? Mm -hmm. And we are talking about this one foundational model, it took the same as one trip, right? Mm. So in the global mm. context, we can, uh, even if we reduce the, uh, you know, we should be reducing the energy consumption, but that's not where the main uh, thing is, right? We are getting, we are trying to optimize, you know, uh, sub, sub, sub 1%, right? It is like 1% uh, of 1%, uh, even if you consider all the deep learning activity going on uh, in the world, right? Mm. And uh, so, I mean, the bigger wins are elsewhere, right? I mean, we can still, we should still try to make things as efficient as possible but uh, we should not be under this impression that, oh, if we fix 
if we cut deep learning training uh, power by half, it's going to have any significant impact uh, because you know all the power consumption is happening or energy consumption is happening elsewhere. And it, it is still a relatively small. We, we talk about this all the time on the show. It's still a relatively small yeah. or like business. It's a relatively small industry. Mostly, yeah. if you are you know spend any significant amount of time with with AI, you pretty much know everybody that does it. And it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's obviously growing by leaps and bounds and there's tons and tons of capital going into it. But at the same time, yeah. um, it's not at a scale. It's a fair point that it's not at a scale that it's not like, say, you know, a, a shipping container uh, worth of carbon emissions every day or, or whatnot. But uh, right. Alex, do you, right. do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, well, that's true. I think it's definitely valid to be concerned about it's something that is skyrocketing certainly. that fast. Like it, it, its pace of growth could definitely render that uh, different yeah. within a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. that, that said, uh, I do agree. And I think that a lot of that could be solved with the same stuff that we were talking about earlier, where if you solve the problem of where the energy is coming from, then you solve a lot of the problems around the carbon emissions and you don't really have to worry about it anymore. It becomes a moot point if you're mm -hmm. powering that off of some other source of energy other than burning fossil fuels. Um, but then also, you know, there's uh, the perspective of, I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, but Timnit Gebrub, who, <laughs> Gebru, who is the person who, um, among others, published uh, some critiques of uh, Google's approach to AI while she was working there uh, yeah. on their ethics team. And part of her critique there was that they were working with these massive data sets. And uh, she was criticizing this on one level from a standpoint of observability where you can't really tell what's going into the model. It's impossible yeah. to sort of monitor it, monitor it mm. and see like where its results are coming from. And that's also a current concern now, like that was a couple of years ago. It's still an ongoing concern where, um, yeah. for example, recently there's articles coming out about how a lot of these art uh, AI generating uh, algorithms are fed by data sets that include porn and violence wow. and atrocities and like yeah. that yeah. stuff is not well managed and it's sort of hidden in there um and people are sort of starting to pick up on that and really report on it and so you know there even, i think could be an advantage that's already itself ai generated apparently there's uh there, there are deep fakes in the data sets for these <laughs> uh like ai systems which is yeah bizarre. and you know besides the fact of you know it may be ripping off artists without the even the possibility That's, of crediting them because you know where that come, stuff comes from. Right. But, you know, working with smaller data sets where you actually know what's in it, on the one hand, like it solves part of this problem where you're just working with these vast amounts of data that chew through a lot of computing power. Um, and by reducing the size of those data sets, you would solve several problems. You know, one of them is the carbon problem, but also the observability problem, the problem mm -hmm. of like where it's sourcing stuff and the problem of like what stuff is getting put into the data set that's going to come out in like unpleasant ways. Um, yeah, yeah so that, think... that's a very big concern actually, especially with, with these very large uh, data sets, there is no way to, I mean, uh, people are going for the science, but they are not putting enough effort and making sure that these data sets are, do not have these. And it's, I don't even know whether it's physically possible to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that all this is uh, high quality and all the bad things don't get in. Uh, so that's a concern. And the other thing uh, that you mentioned, I also uh, completely agree with. Uh, it's it's like if you steal from one person, it is called plagiarism. If you steal from <laughs> a million people, it's then that is, GitHub you know. Pilot. Yes, yes, yeah, same. <laughs> I was just thinking of that, yeah. Right, so, uh, and it is ripping. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very conflicted about this whole thing. Because at, uh, it is true that uh, we are using the work of artists to put them out of business in some sense, right? Yeah, there's well, no way to opt out. And they're also specifically enrich yeah. already very wealthy mega corporations. <sighs> yeah. Right. Um, well, so and then then, but there is there is also this fact that this also adds um, it it allows other people to come and do things, right? For example, the people who are creating art using, you know, Midjourney or mm -hmm. uh, Dali 2, et cetera, they are using a different art form. So it's extending uh, art in some sense, right? It is not just mm -hmm. interpolating, but it's creating new art. I do so, think it's very interesting. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, it's science fiction to me. Um, <laughs> Now yeah, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, and I, uh, disclosure, I, we have we have we have a uh, we have a little thing going on in that uh, which I cannot uh, which I cannot talk about, but that's why I'm conflicted, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah because, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, there's uh oh, has it just gone out of my head? Um, let's see, it had to do with AI and art. Oh yes, uh, it, it all always also ties into this uh, concept where I heard this amazing phrase a few years ago where it's like machine learning is money laundering for bias and like it's mm. the same thing where people assume that like it's a machine it's not like it sort of generates things out of whole cloth uh, you know yeah. it's just a machine it can't be causing harm because it doesn't have any intentions but all it's all of this stuff is programmed no, by humans. it has yeah, it's all yeah. Bias, yeah. And so whatever yeah. humans put into it, like if it's trained on human art, that's going to come out. If it's mm -hmm. trained on humans, yeah. uh, you know, talking on the Internet, that's how you get Microsoft's Taybot, which like ends up yeah. spewing horrible, uh, you know. If you train a robot right. on racism and, and various other flavors of bigotry, you get a racist robot. <laughs> which is why you've got yeah. to monitor your data sets and like make mm -hmm. sure that what you're putting in there is stuff that you're willing to get out of there. Even on ones that aren't uh, that are a little bit more monitored, like GPT three, you end up with situations where like they have to literally go in behind the scenes and shunt mm -hmm. in uh, randomly words for like female or like person of color or whatever uh, to make sure that when you type doctor in, it's not always the white man and nurse isn't right. always like a white woman or whatever, and right. that like you know these different uh, biases that we have culturally don't come mm -hmm. out. Uh, from the machine and you know people think that it's objective and just truth because it comes from the machine it's subjective yeah it, exactly like the, it's very similar to what we're talking about jaywalking and carbon credits yeah that, and in a in a big way and a, a huge danger here and something that I think people really need to be vigilant about is when you're you know meta slash Facebook and Google slash alphabet etc cetera, etc cetera, this is a really, in a, in a big way, this is already being used for them to sidestep their actual responsibilities on their platform. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. they say, oh, well, the robot said, you know. Yeah. Well, so and if, you can't, if you can't specifically blame hmm. a person, then I guess it's fine. And it's having direct real world implications as Absolutely. well. There's people yep. who are, you know, working on a, oh, did we get cut off? Okay. <laughs> no, we are here. All right. Yeah, there's people who think that the, the biggest threat to people is AI, but in the form that, mm -hmm. like, someday it'll be super intelligent and take us all over. When there's real concrete harms being uh, perpetuated by the use of AI right now, like Absolutely. deploying immature AI uh, from companies like Amazon that want to sell it to police forces and stuff, which has led, due to the fact that it still has these biases and it mm -hmm. is poorer at identifying people of certain uh, phenotypes, the mm -hmm. fact that it's led to mistaken arrests of multiple men of color because it's bad at identifying them uh, and telling yeah. them apart. Uh, and, you know, this has having a real world effect right now. We don't need to worry so much about Skynet as just like, you know, our existing Topnet. systems that are in place and them using these objective machine systems mm -hmm. to basically that are perpetuating those problems that already exist in our culture. Yeah. Right. And yeah. soapbox yeah. rant. <laughs> I'm not the first. No, so uh, I mean, but but the good news is that you know the reach of AI uh, beyond these. There are so many different problems where uh, these biases, etc., doesn't they don't matter because yeah. you're working in an industrial. There's no human involved, right? Sure. For sure, uh, you're working yeah. In with industry, so that's that's the promise. We have to be very careful about yes. uh, you know uh, these. Uh, whenever it interacts with humans, uh, AI interacts with humans or it makes decisions for humans. That's where we have to be very, very careful about because yeah. all the progress that has been made, it is, uh, we, are, we are going to lose it if we are not careful with, uh, if we move too fast on some of these things. And that's, that's my concern right now that uh, most of the companies who are working on these things, because it is such an evolving field, there is a mad rush to get something out faster than uh, than yeah. actually doing the right thing. There's there's always going to be casualties in a gold rush, you know. California yeah. had a, a couple. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
there's a just one final little thing here where mm -hmm. I forget who said it, but it, it was something about how machines cannot take responsibilities. So mm -hmm. like if someone does get mistakenly arrested, you know, whose fault is it? Who's going to take responsibility for that and make sure that it doesn't happen again? And um, that, uh, you know, yeah, if we keep them like stay in their lane, there's things that for which this technology is so powerful and really just amazing. Like uh, Peter Ma's clean water AI project always comes up with Hackster because he won, won a ton of contests with it. And it's just this amazingly powerful technology that can use AI to help you detect microbes in water that are harmful. And instead of shipping out new chemical tests, you know, every so often when we, a new uh, toxin is discovered, you can just update the model over the air and instantly have access to that new test in wow. like over all over the world and i just think that kind of stuff is, has so much process mm -hmm. <laughs> promise we just have to you know know where to apply it and where not to right Extremely and i well i think said. you put you put a little skin in the game for some of these companies and the problem fixes itself for example autonomous driving right tesla calls uh, its autopilot uh, calls it autopilot which i completely yeah. hate, uh, yeah. you know, it gives an impression that uh, the technology is very sophisticated and it is an autopilot, but it is not. Uh, but if you put a little skin in the game, for example, if there is a Some law that says that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it could be, let's say a million dollars uh, if you, uh, if a life is lost, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes to the victim's family or whatever, right? It doesn't solve the problem, but it quickly gets, the companies who are producing technology uh, uh, not being careful, uh, without being careful about it, they will quickly go out of business, right? Yes. Let's say there are, you know, there are, and they, well, they uh, let's say there are a thousand, that's, that's not how it yeah, works car yet. company, <laughs> you know, there are a thousand uh, per year casualties and mm -hmm. you, uh, you just lost a billion dollars, right? And for, the, um, for a lot of companies, that's, that's the end of all yeah, profitability. Right. Scaling that uh, to the, the revenue of the company, I think, as well, would be mm, a good addition to yeah. that, where, like, you know, it, there's that uh, cliche where, you know, if a, a crime is uh, punishable just by a fine, then that's just the price you have to pay yeah. to commit it a as a rich person. Just a price. No, it's yeah, a, it, should be, so. it should be an existential crisis, right? You have yes. to put the fine at such a level that uh, it the company goes out of business, right? Absolutely. And that will... That actually doesn't, you know, it's it's very evolutionary uh, this this kind of penalty, mm. because uh, people don't change, right? It's not like the executives in that those companies will become very careful after a few fights. They become virtuous uh, exemplars. They will not. Of they will not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, no, then it doesn't happen, right? Even with humans, humans don't change, mm -hmm. but uh, it works as evolution works. These companies will go out of business, and therefore the system will improve, right? Not because they will learn their lesson. It is that these bad companies will go out of business, right? And that's sense. how uh, evolution also works, right? It's not that, mm. oh, people start learning uh, what's good for them and start correcting their behavior. People don't, uh, and companies don't. They just go out of business, right? So the system <laughs> improves by not having them in the system, right? Same okay. thing with bad drivers. Same yeah. thing with bad drivers. It's not like, they uh, they suddenly realize their mistakes. Uh, no, they just go, they remove themselves from the gene pool and mm. the system improves. Hopefully I mean, sadly, anybody, that's the case. Or they get enough they yeah. points on their them, license and hopefully yeah. they get taken yeah. off anyway. Yeah. yeah, fingers crossed anyway. Um, yeah, we, we went a little bit over. This has been a, a really fun chat. Thanks so much for joining us, Alex. We really got into it. People, I love this. Where can people find you on the internet if they want to if they want to follow oh, you yes. and, and see what you're doing? Uh, let me pull up the yeah can we get the screen up media. there uh, oh you know what where am i i might not actually be up on here yet let me pull myself up <laughs> <laughs> uh so i'm on twitter at glowaski uh oh it's taking a minute to load but uh believe it or not this is actually mm, yeah there you go. well you can ask the uh the story behind that in person sometime i'll uh <laughs> it's a little trivia fact but um Ooh. and then you can also find me on hexter at the same uh username Hextra.io slash GlowAsky. And also Instagram, same deal. Uh, yeah, I would love to chat with people about this stuff. Also, final call to action. Okay, two things. Sign up for the Impact Summit. You're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be releasing who's on it soon. And go to greenee.com, green-ee.com, and click the submit links here. Uh, link there at the top if you have anything that you think should definitely be on this page. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. Much. That's great. Can we get a two-shot operator? 
All right, Satya, you want to take us home? Yeah, thank you, Alex. It was uh, it was having uh, having this conversation was really great, and mm -hmm. you know we wanted people to be aware of these things. You know, we always talk about technical things, but it is equally important that we do things in a sustainable way. And thanks for coming to the show. And, you know, this resource uh, that you have created, that's very useful. It is, you know, we, we all need to think about it and also use it, contribute to it as much as uh, possible and make things, uh, make, make things better. So thank you so much. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well said, Satya. We'll be back Thank here. Thank you, folks, and thanks, everyone. We'll be back. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> we'll be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel, 9 a.m. Thursday, Pacific time. Our guest will be Eric Poehler, who is going to talk about using technology to 3D capture the ruins of Pompeii, among many other mm. awesome, awesome things he's done in his career. I've known Eric off and on on the Internet for going back to my structure sensor days at Occipital, and I'm super excited. Hopefully he can... Uh, uh, enlighten us next week on the show um take care of yourselves out there take care of somebody else if you can and have a great day wherever you may be yeah. operator thank you guys sweet, sweet sweet outro music by the monster association we did it all right another one another one in the can one of these times i tell you really just slouching toward Valhalla here. <laughs> <laughs> and some rough beast did Sarah come around at last. Oh man, yes, it would be great to right. make a, a robot based on the second mm. coming. <laughs> well, if that's not the right thing to end the show on, I don't know what is. Have you... Uh... Thanks, folks. Oh, can they still hear us? Right now they can, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you hear about the time that I think it was WB8 kicked Alistair Crowley down the stairs? Yes, it's I a did. Great story. Mm -hmm. The wickedest man in the world can't take a boot. <laughs> <laughs> Adios. All right, you guys. thank you guys. Bye. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Learn computer vision and AI from the best at opencv.org slash courses. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.